Films in Focus with David Sterrett is underwritten by The Movie House, your destination for first-run Hollywood and independent movies, and a digital portal to the Met Opera, National Theater Live, and special events worldwide in Millerton, New York, and on the web, themoviehouse.net. David Sterrett is the editor-in-chief of the Quarterly Review of Film and Video, contributing writer at Cineast, film professor at the Maryland Institute College of Art, and Robin Hood Radio's very own critic, and guide to all things cinematic. He joins us weekly. We are talking about the DVD, War and Peace. Hi, David. Hi, Jill. How are you doing? It's interesting. (laughs) <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah. Actually, I don't think it's very interesting. It's kind of boring. Uh, all the things I normally go to are closed. Uh, and that includes the movie theaters. And whereas uh, we've got uh, plenty of films that I've seen, uh, which are, you know, so to speak, current re- current releases uh, that you know I could talk about today, since there's no way people could actually go out and see these things. Uh, because in movie theaters, I'm sure that some are still open, but certainly all the movie theaters I go to normally are closed. Uh, and they're closed all over the place. So uh, maybe we'll have to wait a while to talk about interesting new movies like like uh, Baccarat and uh, Charm City Kings and Corpus Christi. And these are movies which are interesting. But again, uh, they're not playing much of anywhere. So let's, I thought, uh, turn our, our lives this week to home video. And then we'll, we'll see what happens in future weeks. Uh, so uh, I thought then... Since people are stuck indoors, and I'm not the first person to observe this, uh, one of the ways to pass the time is by watching something on home video and maybe watching something really long. Maybe one of those things that normally there's not enough time to get around to. And whenever one thinks of really long stories, one thinks of Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace. And there just happens to have been quite recently from the Criterion Collection, a marvelous company that, of course, puts out really excellent home video releases, a really, really fine DVD and Blu-ray edition of, uh, of War and Peace on a couple of discs. And it's a Russian version of War and Peace. And so, you know, I really do recommend it. It's quite a marvelous movie. It's not an excellent, excellent, excellent movie, but it's a really marvelous movie. And if people are interested in War and Peace, if they've read the novel, if they haven't read the novel, I've actually read it more than once. But uh, it's, it's, you know, it's a good way to take care of a whole bunch of hours. The movie is about seven hours long. So uh, it, uh, it, would, it, it would get you through a certain part of these, uh, these plague years if you, if you watch that. So anyway, I'll call attention to it. It's a, it's, it's a good movie uh, directed by a guy named Sergei Bondarchuk, not a very well-known Russian director. In fact, uh, this is his most fav- famous movie. Uh, he also plays the extremely important role of Pierre Bezhukov. And uh, the movie came out in 1966, 1967. It was released over a couple of year period in two parts. And it's kind of interesting that one of the things that got this Russian movie made, Soviet movie, I should say, since it was back in the 60s, one of the things that got it made was the great success in the Soviet Union of a Hollywood version of War and Peace. A uh, Hollywood a director named King Vidor, a very, very fine Hollywood director, uh, made an adaptation of Tolstoy's novel way back in 1956. And uh, the 50s were uh, an era when big screen sprawl was very much uh, in, uh, in fashion. Uh, there were movies like The Robe and Ben-Hur, these great big, huge big screen movies. It's when Cinemascope came in in the 1950s. And uh, War and Peace, the King Vidor War and Peace came out during this period. And it opened in the Soviet Union because right at that time there was a cultural opening between the United States and the Soviet Union. And so uh, the Hollywood version of War and Peace got over there, and Soviet audiences loved it. In fact, uh, apparently about 30 million tickets were sold to this in the Soviet Union. So does this mean that Soviet moviegoers were enthralled with the movie's uh, wobbly grasp of Russian history and culture? Probably not. It probably meant that Soviet audiences were enthralled by Audrey Hepburn who played the extremely important role of Natasha and was, of course, one of the great Hollywood stars of her era and is a perfect Natasha. And uh, anyway, so there it was. The Hollywood version of War and Peace became a huge hit in the Soviet Union way back in uh, in the 1950s. So this did not please the Soviet cultural commissars. Uh, The capitalist West was capitalizing on (laughs) Russia's most celebrated literary treasure. So the Soviet commissars 
Khazars went to work on a war and peace of their own, and they decided it was going to be different from the Hollywood war and peace. Uh, everything about it, the cast, the locations, everything about it was going to be authentically Russian. Uh, and when they decided that Sergei Bondarchuk, this not very important Soviet director, that he would have the job of directing it, uh, the state-run movie industry gave him everything that he needed. He had a virtually unlimited budget and a virtually unlimited schedule to make this movie. So they set about making this, and it opened in Moscow in two installments, the first two parts, that is about the first three and a half hours, in 1962, and the second part in 19, excuse me, in 1966, and the second part in 1967, and then not too long after that, uh, it got to the United States and became the first Soviet film to ever win the Academy Award for Best Foreign Language movie. So uh, I recently wrote about this movie for Cineast Magazine, where I'm a contributing writer, an excellent magazine, by the way, that everybody interested in film should subscribe to. And uh, as I wrote there, uh, Tol Tolstoy's novel is obviously too long and detailed to summarize uh, in a print review or on our show, Jill. Uh, but here's a, just a quick recap for people not familiar with it or who maybe haven't paid any attention to it for a long time, it takes place in the early 19th century, and there are three main characters. One who I already mentioned is Pierre Bezhukov. He is a portly, good-hearted aristocrat, and when we first meet him, he is in love with Napoleon, thinks Napoleon is the greatest thing ever, uh, but then when he starts to realize about the horror of the Napoleonic Wars, uh, he moves to loathing of those wars and of Napoleon himself. In fact, at one point, he contemplates assassinating Napoleon. Then there is Prince Andrei Balkonsky, a melancholy aristocrat saddled with an unhappy marriage, and he also hates the warfare that is going on and that sweeps him up into its grasp. And then the third, who I've also mentioned, is Natasha Rostova, uh, who is gifted, who is ineffably romantic, and who is the daughter of a wealthy old count. So, true to its title, uh, the movie has got all kinds of action, violence, and terror in the war parts, and it's got love, rivalry, ambition, jealousy, hope, in the peacetime parts. And there's an enormous, enormous, enormous number of secondary characters as well. Uh, and a lot of these things are crammed into the seven hour movies. And I recommend spreading it over a couple of days. Weekends are the natural habitat of this seven hour uh, war and peace. The Hollywood war and peace, by the way, is not short itself. It's about three and a half hours starring Henry Fonda and, uh, and Audrey Hepburn. Uh, so the Soviets, again, they were gonna outdo that Hollywood version. So they made it just about twice as long. Uh, interestingly, uh, this is not the first Russian adaptation of War and Peace. There were at least five back in the silent movie days uh, before uh, the Russian Revolution that brought in the, uh, the, uh, the Marxist-Leninist government. But it was decades before a sound version of it arrived, and probably part of the reason why the Soviets were reluctant to tackle War and Peace uh, once the, uh, the, the communist government was installed was that uh, Tolstoy himself in his later years became a religious mystic. And, uh, of course, the, uh, the Marxist government of the Soviet Union was officially atheistic. Uh, but when good old Nikita Khrushchev uh, became the, uh, the, the, the premier of the Soviet Union and brought in the famous thaw, uh, loosening up a whole lot of the, uh, the totalitarian aspects of the Stalin regime, uh, that's what brought about these US-USSR cultural exchanges that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and it also uh, encouraged them, okay, maybe we will now actually go back to war and peace again. We're not so worried as we were before about the fact that uh, Tolstoy uh, had a great, very powerful religious side. We'll just we'll just go to the novel and we can, we can do that now. So we can thank Khrushchev, among other things things uh, during his too brief reign uh, for, uh, for, for allowing this war and peace to get made. Now, I mentioned that this is now a Criterion Collection release, and it's not the first time this movie has been available on home video, but this is certainly, I've, I've seen the other version that was out earlier, uh, years earlier, and this is definitely the best. But as if the seven-hour movie weren't enough, uh, Criterion has stuck in a whole lot of extras, all kinds of other stuff you can look at. And there's a funny theme that, you know, there's making of documentaries, more than one of those, uh, and there's various commentators who comment on different aspects of the movie and stuff. And a lot of this stuff, I've looked at it all, uh, a lot of this stuff is really quite worthwhile and, and is great if you really want to get into the background of the movie, although you certainly don't don't have to look at all this stuff. Uh, but one of the interesting themes that runs through a whole lot of the extras on the Criterion edition of War and Peace is that the director, uh, Sergei Bondarchuk, was not, not, not popular. Pretty much 
nobody liked him and nobody got along with him. Now, part of this was professional resentment. Why did this guy get the job of directing this fabulously budgeted movie with all the resources of the Soviet movie industry at his fingertips? Why did he get this job when he had directed exactly one previous movie? And that was in fairly intimate drama that he had done in the late 1950s. Uh, so a lot of people just resented that. And that was one of the reasons why people didn't like him. Another thing is that apparently, well, he came from a rural background and that made some of the sophisticates in the Soviet film industry think of him as a bumpkin. Uh, but also apparently his, his, just his behavior, he was a very egotistical guy. Uh, and in the Marxist studio system, at least officially, you were supposed to value artistic teamwork. It was the collective. It was the group that did everything. And he, at one point, had been known to comment that the director had to be the czar and the god uh, on the movie set. So that also made him unpopular. Uh, and uh, anyway, a lot of people quit. His cinematographers quit. He lost a few of them before one finally took over and did most of the movie. They just left. They couldn't stand dealing with him. Uh, and there were others who didn't like him at all. At one point, even his son, Bondarchuk's own son, who became a filmmaker himself, comments on the fact that nobody liked my father, you know. So uh, that's kind of an amusing thing that comes out in a whole lot of these of these extras. But, you know, the best argument in favor of Sergei Bondarchuk is simply that he got this movie made. Uh, it did have an unlimited budget, just about, uh, and it did have an open-ended schedule, schedule and all of that, but he was able to make really use of all of these things and the things that he did to get this movie made. And all of this is on the screen, so it's very relevant to people who want to look at this movie. Uh, there were something like 25,000 costumes and uniforms that were sewn by hand for this movie. Uh, hairdressers were brought in from Paris uh, to do the, 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 the coiffures for Natasha's first ball, which is a high point of the novel and of all the movie versions. Uh, the military uh, gave Bondarchuk high-level generals to help him plot out the combat scenes. Uh, the ballroom was equipped with camera towers and cranes. A whole replica of old Moscow was built with, with camera tracks honeycombed all the way through it, and then it was burned spectacularly to the ground uh, for the great burning of Moscow, which is an exceedingly important part of the plot. All this was, un was, was, was just gigantic, and also, and this was very unusual for the Soviet who like to do a lot of their movie making in the studio where you can control everything. They did all the outdoor shooting on location and in Russia that's not easy because the weather is not necessarily so great there. So that uh, caused a lot of delays and so forth. It's kind of funny that one thing, one thing, one thing that the government would not give Bondarchuk despite his, his, his pleas and requests, he wanted to use American film stock, Kodak, and German cameras and there, the cultural commissar said, no, 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 this is going to be the definitive Soviet film and there's going to be no capitalist gear here. And as a result of that, equipment was breaking down all the time. And there was a lot of times when the film stock that they had on hand to do the actual shooting with was unusable. But the communist bona fides were, were undiluted. It was a communist film and not a capitalist film. The final cost of the movie was, was officially given out as $29 million, which is a pretty hefty budget for the 1960s, but it has been estimated at actually being upwards of $700 million in today's dollars. What a gigantic budget. Although, this was a Soviet production, so the only hard rubles were actually paid out to the cast and crew. A lot of the other stuff was handled in, in various communistic ways. So, of course, the two things you have to do when you're adapting such a gigantic novel is you have to pare away a lot of material. Uh, you have to, uh, you know, just take stuff that isn't essential and get rid of it. And then the other thing that you have to do is to balance the explosiveness of the war part with the intimacy of the peace parts. And I think that Bondarchuk did a good job of all this. Uh, it's not a masterpiece of a movie, but it's a really good movie. It's very, very well done. Bondarchuk again himself decided, and by the way, he had been named a, people art, a people's artist of the Soviet Union for his work as an actor uh, before he ever became a movie director. So he was a very good actor, and he does a very good job of playing uh, Pierre. Again, it's not a great performance, but it's a good performance. And uh, it's kind of interesting that he actually is kind of portly. He's kind of pudgy. Uh, in the Hollywood version of War and Peace, Henry Fonda, who is ridiculously svelte, uh, plays Pierre, who is basically a fat guy. So uh, Bondarchuk's performance is a little bit more uh, on the wire there. And of course, Bondarchuk gets all this huge, gigantic, just 
spectacular nature of the movie onto the screen in a very convincing way. So in the long run, should people look at this uh, movie, this Soviet version of War and Peace, uh, in the wonderful Criterion Collection edition? Uh, I think that it's w well worth looking at. Certainly if you have any interest in the novel or any interest in Tolstoy or any interest in Russian culture, it's very definitely worth going to. And even if you have no interest in those things, it's just a movie that you can just bask in. It goes on and on and on, and it's got incredible variety within it. And I'm going to finish by quoting Ella Taylor, a very good film critic with whom I am acquainted. And she wrote an essay that appears in a booklet for the Criterion release. And she describes the movie as a binge of monumental too muchness. And that's exactly what it is. So if you want to have a great binge of monumental too muchness uh, in this period when there is not enough going on with so many of us, this, this, these plague years that we're going through, or at least plague weeks, uh, I recommend the, this wonderful edition of War and Peace. It'll take up a lot of hours, and you'll have a dramatically good time watching it. And that is my Soviet-era story this week, Jill. Thank you very much, David Sterrett, Films in Focus. It's the DVD, War and Peace. Peace.